Some time ago, some of my art students asked me to pose with them to take a selfie. And then one of them said, I know, let's all take, make duck faces. And I thought, duck faces. Is there anyone else here that's uncomfortable making a duck face for a selfie? <laughs> my second thought was, it's official, Linda, you're old. It was so clear to me that I simply didn't understand some things that my students were very comfortable with. And now I share a couple of the selfies they've sent me. Now, is there anyone else that feels really kind of worried about this? <laughs> I am, and yet I have to laugh, right? They're having a fabulous time. Or what about this one? Do we really want our grandmothers to see these pictures? Isn't that the rule? And then there's this one. <laughs> and you know, finally, this sort of broke me over. I like this selfie. I'm a visual artist. There's that space in between them. I think it's fantastic. And yet still, what I saw with these selfies is that there was much I didn't understand. And while this is a very strange audience to say this, I here today admit to you that I failed Facebook. Facebook and all of social media came out at a time in my life, because let's face it, I've already admitted that I'm old. It came out at a time in my life where I was too engrossed in what I do. I'm a visual artist. I carve time out for my studio, and I'm loath to have other distractions. But my students live through and in social media. So, if I was going to understand this increasing difference, I, the sign that I felt that said, finally, Linda, the gap between you and your students is too big, I decided I needed to do some research. But to start, to begin my investigation, I first had to stop. I had to stop reading the academic articles about the dangers of social media or the mass narcissism in contemporary cultures. And I could not see another television piece about a dangerous and disastrous selfie. Instead, I had to pull back and see myself, see my issue through the lens as me, Linda, the artist and the visual arts educator. So, selfies. When cameras became standard equipment on our phone, and when we, with one click, could flip the lens around and see ourselves, selfies were born, and our cell phones forevermore became our self phones. Wow. I think we take selfies mostly because we can, right? <laughs> And absolutely everybody takes selfies. We know this. Our babies take selfies. <laughs> and our pets take really good selfies, right? <laughs> and we take selfies, and now this one the grandmother can see, right? We take selfies just because it's a great day, and it takes too long for the light to change, and the girls are happy, so they take a selfie. Or the art students are going for a ride. Fabulous. Although I don't know if their moms are happy about the motorcycle, but there you go. Off it goes. And then there's the friends from all over the world that join together, and they take a very old-fashioned selfie with a camera, but you know it's going to go to each of them to commemorate their time together. And then there's the swim team. They have to commemorate their victory and how wonderful that they can take a selfie and say, I've accomplished something. But no matter what the message at the bottom of the selfie says, the reality is, is when we send a selfie, we are saying, I am here. This is me. Please look at me. And we do. It's in our DNA to look. In prehistoric times, there was this 
very important period of time, the era of evolutionary adaptation, when humans learned some survival skills that were completely visual. They learned to be constantly alert and aware of any movement and stimulus. They were, they were aware of flashes of bright color, sometimes just because that would be the ripest fruit. But they were trained, their brains were trained to always be on the lookout for faces. And so are we. When we see faces in our everyday life, even on inanimate objects, we get this kind of funny little pleasure, even if it's in the, my sink of dirty dishes. But there's another connection between the prehistoric people, the early humans, and us today, now. And I take you to the cave paintings. We don't know exactly why these people painted these amazing things in caves centuries ago. But there they are, depicting themselves and their animals, their hunts. And they show them alongside symbols that talked about their, their culture. It was their symbol, their language, their mark at that point. When I was standing in Spain, looking up, looking up at all of these hands, Oh my gosh, the exuberance, the humanity from all those centuries ago was present right there with me. And I marveled because I thought at the time, what are they saying? They are saying, I am here. This is what's important to me. So now when I lay these two images side by side, it's a little shocking, isn't it? We're saying the same things. It's amazing, isn't it, to consider that culture has flipped full circle back around to ideas of communication that happened before written language. If you think about the sites on Tumblr and Instagram, where friends and strangers, artists and non-artists, all join together to, to create and share their images, they don't have to write anything. The power of the image says it all. So when I think about selfies, there's the garden variety, the, the sort of uh, commemorating and making the visual archives that we'll now have instead of Fobo albums, right? The cloud is very heavy. When you think now about where selfies might take us, I suggest that we start to look at where some shifts have happened that perhaps we haven't seen. When we finally decide that we're willing to look out to the world instead of asking the world always to look at us, something changes and we begin to see more. I don't think these kinds of shots are an accident. I've started to think that there's this need on the person eventually to turn their selfie around. First, they might just look at the feet, but eventually they're going to look out and see this great world in front of them. And at that point, there's the possibility for a shift. At that point, they can see like artists. It's kind of amazing to me, but I really do think well, I just have to say, I would still like to have my students turn their cell phones off when I'm teaching. But I have to say that cell phones, truly, when I look at all that's happening now, cell phones are actually helping culture to slow down. Now, that seems impossible, doesn't it? But let's think about it. When, when people begin to shift their attention, outwards towards the world, when they take the time to slow down and to notice things change, and they begin to see, I think, like artists see. When people are walking along in their everyday world, when they can turn back and look at themselves, things are different. They can see themselves in new ways. And then there's really the everyday. 
as we're walking along, when we decide, instead of just noticing this strange green growing sofa that's set on the curb as though to be taken away by the garbage, when we stop, we pause, maybe we even drive around the block because we want to take a picture of it to share with someone else. When we just see a beautiful piece of red on a car and we take the photograph, we've paused in our world. We've allowed ourselves to see more visually. And then there's the happenstance of the neighbor's cat on my skylight. It's fun. How did that happen at the same time I walked by, right? I couldn't get him to do it again. And then there's just walking down the street, and you glance up, and there's this light fixture in this perfect little O. Wow. You take a picture. I teach art students how to see, how to look with keen observation. And I think about seeing a lot. Seeing really is an unconscious activity. When we're babies, someone has to teach us how to speak. And later, they have to teach us how to write. But the infant, the baby's eyes clear, vision just happens. We can see. And then for the rest of our lives, our brains and our eyes are constantly modulating back and forth between what compels us to look, the stimulus or the distraction, and then also where we direct our attention. Such a shift. Now there's room for focus and choice. And this is where we want to go. When I ask my students for images for this talk, I was flooded with these amazing images. And I was suddenly aware that I was seeing something that I expected only to see in the classroom. I felt embarrassed that I hadn't realized it. But what I saw from the students and what I see from artists and non-artists is this careful and keen observation of their daily life, of their world. I also see the willingness to take the time, to spend the time, even though there's probably no return on their investment, except for the pure pleasure of seeing. When it comes down to it, people who accomplish things ha portray some very old-fashioned ideas and characteristics, like patience and grit, commitment, discipline. These are qualities that I admire in my students and in other artists and in anyone else who brings their ideas forward. My last image is a very old selfie. It was taken when I was my student's age, so that tells you something. Apollo 17, there it is, an old selfie when we could see ourselves. I think it's a good reminder that sometimes we need to pause and take the long view. It's easy for me to not like social media. It's easy for me to be frustrated in, when I'm trying to pull my students out of it. But the fact of the matter is, they're learning important lessons there. And so while I'll still make them turn off my, their cell phones during my class, I'm happy to see them engaged visually all the time. Because, you know, at the end of the day, learning doesn't just happen in my classroom. And it's a good reminder for us that we never know where learning will and change will happen. Thank you very much.